Hello everyone, and welcome back to tier 4 of the Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg. The last entry on this one is really disturbing, so I think it's going to move us into... We're going to start moving into more disturbing topics as we go on tier 5, tier 6. With that in mind, thank you for choosing to spend some time with me today. I really appreciate it, and let's get into it. In the small town of Craig, Alaska, one of the most interesting unsolved murders took place. The small city has a population of about 1,300 people and is about 220 miles north of Juneau, the Alaskan capital. On September 7, 1982, a ship was anchored in a harbor about a mile outside of Craig, which had been discovered to have caught fire. First responders, after putting out the fire, found the charred remains of multiple people. Arson investigators began to look at the crime scene and determined that the fire was no accident. It had been started by someone looking to cover up their crimes. The ship was a 58-foot fishing vessel by the name of The Investor, hence the name The Investor Massacre. The ship was owned and captained by a 28-year-old by the name of Mark. On the journey prior to the fire, Mark had been accompanied by seven people. They were four ship employees, Mark's two younger children, and Mark's wife, who was three months pregnant. On September 9th, autopsies were performed on two of the bodies and they actually showed signs of having been murdered prior to the fire. Some people also reported to have seen a person buying two and a half gallons of gas in Craig before making their way to the dock where the investigator was burned. However, the eyewitness accounts of what he looked like differ from person to person and began to differ even more so as time went on. Honestly, this one could be a video on its own. There's so much information, so if that is something that you'd like all the details on, let me know in the comments, and I'll get it added to the content bank. Taking place in an I Can't Believe It's Yogurt shop in Austin, Texas on Friday, December 6, 1991, the Austin Yogurt Shop killings is a quadruple homicide of four teenage girls between the ages of 13 and 17. The four girls were employees of the shops and were cleaning up after closing time, which was 11 p.m. About an hour before closing, a man was permitted to use the toilet in the back, which took a very long time, which he may have used to jam a rear door open. A couple who left the shop just before closing reported seeing two men at a table acting odd. Around midnight, a police patrolman reported a fire at the shop and first responders discovered the bodies of the girls inside. The girls were not killed in the fire, however, but had been shot in the head and sexually assaulted. A 22 and a 380 were used to commit the murders, and the perpetrators probably exited out the back door that had been found unlocked. The Austin Police Department has DNA from an unknown male as the result of one of the sexual assaults, and a Y chromosome match for a perpetrator has been found in an FBI database. However, it doesn't reveal the identity of the man, as thousands of men have this fragment of DNA, so it's unable to identify individuals, just narrow down the suspect list. The Marcel Bar Massacre is the mass murder of 10 people in a bar in Marcel, France on October 3rd, 1978. Three armed gunmen entered the bar and shot everyone in the head, with one survivor being the owner's wife who was in a different room. Police believe the attack was part of a gang war and the killings were actually compared to the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, which I talk about in this video here. The investigative judge in charge of the case was also shot dead on October 21st, 1981. While gang violence is thought to be the reason, no one has ever been convicted, so this still could just be a random act of violence. Do you want to hear a real conspiracy? Roughly 50% of all my viewers are not subscribed. That's 50% of people, that's half of the people that watch my videos are not subscribed. Go ahead, hit that subscribe button today. On July 25th, 1946, four young African Americans were murdered by a mob of white men. This is kind of like the OG George Floyd case because it attracted national attention and launched protests across the country. President Harry Truman himself created the President's Committee on Civil Rights and his administration introduced anti-lynching legislation in Congress but could not get it past the Southern Democratic Bloc. The FBI investigated, which was the first time it had been ordered to investigate a civil rights case, but it was unable to discover sufficient evidence to bring any charges. In the 1990s, publicity about the case led to a new investigation. The state of Georgia and the FBI finally closed their case in December of 2017, again unable to prosecute any suspects. 
There is now a state historical marker placed in 1999 at the site of the attack. Okay, so when I'm talking about cool names, this is what I'm talking about. Annihilator. Bro, this is such a cool name. Like, supervillains get the name Annihilator. And we're giving real people this name? Real people who kill people get the name Annihilator. And I'm stuck with Cameron. Messed up. The Servant Girl Annihilator, also known as the Midnight Assassin, also cool name, was an unidentified American serial killer who stalked through the city of Austin, Texas between 1884 and 1885. On December 26, 1885, the New York Times reported that, quote, murders were committed by some cunning madman who is insane on the subject of killing women. This was one of the first serial killers in the United States, happening three years before Jack the Ripper in Europe. Oddly enough, actually, in 1888, it was brought up that Jack the Ripper and this killer could be the same person. The Oakland County Child Killer is the name given to the perpetrator responsible for the serial killing of at least four children in Oakland County, Michigan between 1976 and 1977. Two boys and two girls between the ages of 10 and 12 went missing from outside of their houses. Each child's body was discovered in a public area within 19 days of their disappearance. The children were all strangled or shot, with the two boys also having been sexually abused. Once the victims were dead, the killer would disperse their bodies around the county in places where they could be seen from the roadways. The victims were held captive before they were killed, and forensic DNA testing has indirectly implicated two suspects, one of whom has since died, and the other is already serving life in prison for offenses against children. The DNA profile created from samples taken from some of the victims' bodies is said to be from a main perpetrator, but does not match the DNA of anyone named in connection with the case, and the identity still is unknown. The Santa Rosa Hitchhiker Murders were a series of at least seven unsolved homicides involving female hitchhikers that took place in Sonoma County and Santa Rosa in California in 1972 and 1973. All of the victims were found nude in rural areas, either near steep embankments or in creek beds near roads. There are a few suspects, two of which are already infamous. The Zodiac Killer, is a suspect due to the similarities between an unknown symbol on his January 29th, 1974 letter to the San Francisco Chronicle and the Chinese characters on a missing soy barrel carried by one of the victims. He also said that in the future he would no longer announce to anyone when he commits his murders and they'll look like routine robberies, killings of anger, or an accident which is faked. Another suspect of the killings is Ted Bundy. He had spent some time in the neighboring Marin County, but was ruled out by a Sonoma County detective in the 1970s and again in 1989. Detailed credit card records and some known whereabouts of Bundy reveal that he was in Washington on the dates of some of the disappearances. However, a 2011 article noted that the dates of the receipts show that there would have been more than enough time for Bundy to make his way down to California, commit the crimes, and then drive back to Washington. He was known to drive hundreds of miles to commit a murder, so it's not out of the question. The Freeway Phantom, another cool name by the way, is the name of a serial killer who murdered five young girls and an older woman in Washington, D.C. between April 1971 and September 1972. There have been a number of investigators and this case has attracted a lot of interest over the years. Numerous tips came in from the public to a hotline operated by the police department of the District of Columbia and information and tips were also received by mail. All of the leads were investigated to their conclusion, some of which were proven to not be viable and others required substantial investigation. Practice of the police department at the time was that case files were retained by the detectives assigned to the case. As a result, the case files are incomplete. Some of the files have been discarded entirely, while others are incomplete with pages or pieces of evidence being lost, along with their notes, and all of the investigators who originally worked on this case have long retired, a lot of which are deceased. No leads yet have had enough evidence for prosecution, and a reward of $150,000 is available. The Annecy shootings were the killings of four people on September 5, 2012 in France. The attack took place in a lay-by on the mountainside road around 3.45 p.m. 25 shots were fired in total. Initial reports stated that only one pistol was fired and the analysis of the cartridge cases showed that the weapon used was actually a Luger P06. 
The bodies were discovered by a bicyclist shortly after the murders, but he claims he didn't hear the gunshots. However, based on approximate time, he was biking over a bridge and the sound of the rushing water could have drowned out gunshots. In September of 2017, after five years of investigation, French police said they have no working theory to explain the murders and no suspect. The lead prosecutor suggested that those killed may have just been targeted randomly. On January 12th of 2022, a man was actually arrested in connection with the murders. Along with his arrest, house searches were conducted and detectives re-examined the alibis of the suspect. However, he was released shortly after, with prosecutors saying that the man had been ruled out as the killer. The Honolulu Strangler is the name of a serial killer and sexual assaulter who is believed to have killed five women in Hawaii from 1985 to 1986. The Honolulu Police Department established a 27-person serial task force on September 5th with the help of the FBI. The killer's profile was that he was an opportunist who attacked women who were vulnerable, such as at bus stops. After the fifth victim had been found, police set up roadblocks to question commuters. Witnesses said they had seen a light-colored van and a man with the victim's car. Police arrested Howard Gay on May 9th as the primary suspect. The suspect's ex-wife and current girlfriend described him as a smooth talker. They also noted that he was into bondage, which could be a clue considering that the victims were sexually assaulted. His girlfriend said that on nights they fought, he would leave the house, and these nights are actually the same nights as the murders. Howard, however, was interrogated and eventually released. Police followed him and a $25,000 reward for information was put out. Two months after the arrest of Howard, a woman came forward and claimed she saw the victim with a man on the night of the murder. She successfully picked Howard out of a photo lineup as the man, but did not want to be a witness because she believed that he saw her as well. Unfortunately, Howard died in 2003 unprosecuted, so this remains unsolved. The Mayojo 56 building fire was a fire that happened around 1 a.m. local time on September 1, 2001. September 2001 was a rough month for buildings. The fire burned for five hours before it was put out and resulted in the deaths of 44 people and with three others injured. It's suspected that the fire was the result of arson, but no suspect was ever arrested. In the aftermath, media coverage, which declined 10 days later due to two different buildings collapsing in New York, USA, a video about Osama bin Laden here, focused on the arrest and conviction of the property owners for criminal negligence and on the building's ties to organized crime. The fire started on the third floor of the building. 19 people were on the third floor and 28 were on the fourth floor. The three who were injured were three employees who jumped out of the building from the third floor and survived, but obviously suffered severe injuries. By the time firefighters got inside to remove the bodies of the 32 women and 12 men from inside the building, the victims were long gone. Police said that the reason the fire was so lethal was due to the numerous violations of fire code, including blocking fire doors and stairwells. Six people were arrested on charges of professional negligence resulting in death, including the building owner and the commercial tenants of the building. Five of the people were convicted, but the sixth was acquitted. Tokyo police concluded that the fire was the result of arson, but have not made any arrests in relation to the setting of the fire itself. In 2006, the building was demolished and replaced with a one-story restaurant. We're on to the last entry, which I kind of said earlier is pretty disturbing, so um, if you'd like to click away now, go ahead. This is the case of sexual assault of multiple children and murder. So, again, if, if that's not something that you can stomach, you know, feel free to click off. Thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Otherwise, let's get into this last entry. Mr. Cruel, again, a pretty cool name for a killer, especially one this evil, is the name of the suspect of several child sexual assault cases and the suspect of the murder of Carmi and Chan in Melbourne, Australia during the late 1980s and early 1990s. There is a reward of 200,000 Australian dollars for the two abductions he committed and a $1 million reward for the arrest and conviction of the killer of Carmi and Chan. Police described him as highly intelligent, that he meticulously planned each attack, conducted surveillance on the victims and their families, and he left no forensic traces 
protected his identity by covering his face at all times, and left red herrings to divert family and police attention. He was often soft-spoken and his behavior was unhurried, as he actually took a break during an attack in one of the victim's houses to eat a meal. On August 22, 1987, a man wearing a balaclava broke into a family home at 4 a.m. armed with a knife and a handgun. He tied the hands and feet of both parents and locked them in a wardrobe. He then tied their son to a bed and sexually assaulted the 11-year-old daughter. After he was done there, he cut the phone lines and left. On December 27, 1988, he broke into a family home via the back door around 5.30 a.m. wearing the same balaclava and armed with a handgun. He bound and gagged the parents and demanded money. He then grabbed their 10-year-old daughter, put tape over her eyes and a ball gag in her mouth, then abducted her. She was released 18 hours later. On July 3, 1990, he broke into a family home at 11.30 p.m., again armed with a gun and wearing a balaclava. He tied and gagged a 13-year-old girl, placed tape over her eyes, disabled the phone, and searched for money. He then drove to another house and molested the poor girl for 50 hours before releasing her at a power substation. On on April 13, 1991, a man wearing a balaclava broke into a family home at around 8.40 p.m. armed with a knife. He abducted 13-year-old Carmian Chan. Her decomposed body was found a year later with three gunshot wounds to the head. Police said that there isn't enough evidence to link this crime to Mr. Cruel, however, despite very similar circumstances. And that's it. That's Tier 4 of the Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg. I hope you enjoyed the video. A lot of these had not a lot of information on them, but if you want to know more about any of these subjects, leave a comment down below, and I'll see what I can do about making a future video. Thank you for choosing to spend some time with me today. It really means a lot, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.